Ladies and gentlemen, would everybody please take your seats? If you would please take your seats, let's close the doors, get everybody in here, please. All right, we have made a little change in our schedule. If I could have your attention, please. You know how it is dealing with the airlines. You're at their mercy. So Bill Black is on his way here. His flight from Kansas City was canceled this morning. So he's getting into Hayden at 3.49. We're going to do the debate at 4.30. Um, we will do our best to bring you the debate at 4.30. If not, we have Dan Mitchell and, and Rob Douglas at that time, and I can assure you that regardless of who, which of the three of them show up on this stage, it will be a compelling presentation. Now, if you attended our 2011 Freedom Conference, you probably remember laughing yourself silly over the Oppressed View panel. Does anybody remember that? Well, we're thrilled that one of our members of the Oppressed View panel has come back again this year. He is an Amazon best-selling author, and we're proud that he's also a member of the Steamboat Institute's Honorary Board of Directors. And now, let's take a quick preview of the always hilarious Kevin Jackson. You had Maxine Waters say that the Tea Party members should all go to hell. Well, I will tell you where hell is. Hell is in the black communities that the Congressional Black Caucus serves. Hold on just a second. What did you just say? I said these policies are racist. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us is the author of The Big Black Lie, How I Learned the Truth About the Democratic Party. Kevin Jackson, first of all, were you there on Saturday at the Capitol when Congressman Lewis and other members of the Congressional Black Caucus were at upon? Were you there for that? A lot of what they were saying had happened actually hadn't occurred. I've been to many Tea Parties around the country, and I've yet to see any real violence towards anybody. Far left's making a big deal out of the Tea Party movement being almost all white, implying it's a racist situation. Joining us now from St. Louis, Kevin Jackson. I call it Emancipation 2. This time, everybody gets free. With us now, reaction from Tea Party activist Kevin Jackson. Kevin, what'd you make? Wow, I think he managed to sum up the Democrat and elitist position very succinctly by saying that black people are stupid and white people are racist. The thing that gets me most, Neil, is that the ease in which he makes these comments. Guess what? When blacks like myself, conservative blacks, go off the plantation, and what they do is they do what they did to Ken Gladney in St. Louis. They give you a beat down. And if they can't do it physically, they're going to do it verbally. Yeah, it's complete suffer to you. But the fact of the matter is, Carson made an incendiary comment that has no place in American right. politics and in the lexicon of today. The Democratic operatives were destroying their own property so that somehow people would just, I don't know, just choose to blame them on Republicans. You really believe yeah, that? Yeah, it's kind of like when there are riots in Watts and black people go and loot their own stores and you wonder why did it happen? It's the same reason. So when you can tell me with complete evidence that the people that are doing this are Republicans, and I'll be happy to answer your question. But until well, then, all you've got is anecdotal evidence. Mean, this is illogical. The same way that you have anecdotal evidence around the Tea Party groups and saying that everybody's a racist, when I'm an example of a person who's been to these events, not well, one single racial incident can I point out. There's a racist fringe to this, and that I wish Republican leaders and Tea Party well, there's a racist like fringe to the Democrat Party, because as I said, I have yet to see a black man lynched at a Tea Party. But I do know that the Democrat Party has lynched black people. So if you want to make that equivalency, then let's talk about that for a bit. Kevin Jackson. Uh, Kevin, you know I disagree with you on a lot of stuff, but I do appreciate you coming on today. My Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Rocky, Rocky Mountain welcome to Kevin Jackson. I'm going to tell you, folks, I'm here because you've been tricked. You thought that this was the Steamboat Institute Conference, but in reality, you're part 
of a new reality TV show called Mass White Conservative Intervention. <laughs> Have you seen the show Intervention? It's a film where they, they the show where they take an attic and the entire family is uh, committed to no longer uh, enabling the attic. So the Steamboat Institute is family, and you guys are the addicts. <laughs> and I'm the person who's going to help you through this intervention today, and my name is Kevin Jackson, best-selling author of a book called The Big Black Lie, and my latest release, Sexy Brilliance and Other Political Lies. Added that other part so you wouldn't think it was about me. <laughs> so I'm, gonna he I'm here to deliver tough love. And as they say in intervention, if you accept this gift, <laughs> There's a jumbo jet waiting outside to take you to my treatment center, the Black Sphere Center for Unwavering Conservatism. And there you will receive a new backbone, a non-politically correct attitude adjustment. And I want to tell you, my backbones are American-made, an alloy of tungsten steel, titanium, and a little something that Colonel West, Herman Cain, and Star Parker and I call secret sauce. <laughs> so you may be wondering, so why has Kevin been brought here by the Steamboat Institute? And it's because I'm a warrior. And as one of my team said, Kevin, I think you can clap with your eyelids. <laughs> as opposed to starting a TV show called Man vs. Wild, but the network didn't want kids thinking lava was safe to eat. <laughs> Seriously, folks, I'm honored to speak to you today. Uh, Last year we did the Oppressed View panel, as you guys know, and, and um, really sad that Tony's not with us this year because he was so much fun on that. He was the kind of the oddball white guy. He's like, what am I doing here? I'm not exactly oppressed. <laughs> yeah, you got an accent, Tony. That's why we're oppressing. Anyway, so my, so my talk today is going to be an attempt to explain how we have ended up back in the 60s and, and what I call full circle flipped. And uh, the astute of you may be asking, what are you saying, Kevin? Did you, are you talking about the 1960s or are you talking about the 1860s? And in fact, I'm talking about both. As Ayn Rand said, you can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. So why do I say we've become full circle flip? Because in years past, we had white Republicans marching arm in arm to fight for the civil rights of blacks as white Democrats jeered. Today, we have black Republicans fighting shoulder to shoulder for white Republicans as black Democrats jeer. A reverse civil rights movement is afoot, which I call emancipation too. This time, even the white folks get freed. <laughs> so what are we up against? Obama dismissed the Tea Party. Pelosi said we were radicals. But to show you how crazy liberals think, Charles Freeman, Obama's National Intelligence Council appointee, called the protest of Tibetan monks race riots. For some people, uh, some time rather, people have asked me uh, if the grassroots is dead, and I think we have, we're finally beginning to answer that question for them. And I, I've thought about it this way. The media thinks that the grassroots is a baby. And like most leftists, they'd like to abort the baby. But instead, the baby was put up for adoption, and the Republicans adopted the baby. But secretly, the Republicans hoped that the baby would stay a baby forever. They wanted it to remain cute and cuddly like a purse dog, a special interest group like blacks or the religious right. But we grew up. And we are dealing with politics on both sides. And what we learned is who Obama really is. Liberals ignored all the signs. They had the man of their dreams. There was Obama. He was getting out of a borrowed Cadillac at a payday loan joint to cash a check. But what they didn't realize was that he was cashing a hot check. By now, though, liberals have figured out that Obama is about as useful, useful as a golf club at a tennis match. <laughs> so what I want to discuss is how the black vote has impacted us, and why do we always discuss the black vote, and I want to discuss the cost of that vote. So I'm going to begin with the Constitution. Black people were written specifically into the founding documents, and slavery is seen in a few key places. The first is in what's called the Enumeration Clause, where representatives are apportioned mistaken by liberals that Republicans only valued blacks as three-fifths of a person. In Article 1, Section 9, Congress is limited expressly from prohibiting the importation of slaves before 1808, a date that represented a compromise of 20 years. So January 1st of 1808 was actually the first date that was supposed to be the end of slavery. 
And then the third place that we're mentioned is the Fugitive Slave Clause, which is uh, essentially a states' rights issue, and it required that an escaped slave be delivered back to the property holder in the state where the property had escaped from. And this is a provision that the Democrats still try to enforce today. <laughs> Some of them are going to get that later. So then we had Civil War politics, and blacks were referred to as slaves during this time, and it's been said that the seeds of the Civil War were fought over the issue of slavery, and they were sown in the compromise of the Constitution on the issue of prohibiting slave or the importation of slaves. But it had a loophole, and Democrats decided to make the descendants of slaves slaves, and thus slavery had the potential to go on forever, which is not what the Founding Fathers wanted. Then there came Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, blacks were referred to as coloreds. This was the uh, era of what they called radical Reconstruction. And it should have been called the first black renaissance because blacks got the right to vote and more blacks served in politics than in any time in history. Then came the Roaring Twenties and we were called Negroes. By the time the Twenties came around, blacks were mainstream and this period ushered in what was called the Harlem Renaissance the black cultural revolution that was centered in Harlem, New York. I call this the second black renaissance because the movement was primarily literary. It involved art, music, dance, and theater. You guys remember the Charleston? Black people. <laughs> Fostered black pride in the uplifting of the race through the use of intellect. Using artistic talents, blacks challenged racial stereotypes and helped promote racial integration during this time a sort of passive civil rights movement had begun during this period, not so much with protest, but with blacks focusing on self-importance. And came the New Deal. We were called Afro-Americans, only group of people I know that were named after a hairstyle. <laughs> Lucky for you mullet Americans, right? So until the New Deal, blacks had shown their traditional loyalty to the party of Abraham Lincoln by voting overwhelmingly Republican. But by the end of Roosevelt's first term, one of the most dramatic shifts in voting history occurred. In 1936, 75% of blacks voted Democrat. Up to that point, we'd voted 95% Republican. Yeah. And part of it was they felt like the, the great um, we got relief from the Great Depression through some of uh, FDR's policies, but part of the other reason was the GOP had done little to repay the earlier support from blacks. Sounds kind of familiar. As I say, this period most resembles a state of liberal blacks in America today in that they feel abandoned by the Republicans. However, they are willing to be taken advantage of by Democrats. But what was interesting is most New Deal programs discriminated against blacks. National Recovery Administration not only offered whites the first crack at jobs, but authorized separate and lower pay scales for blacks. The FHA refused to guarantee mortgages for blacks who tried to buy in white neighborhoods. The CCC maintained segregated camps. Social Security excluded jobs that were predominantly tr filled by blacks. And the Agricultural Adjust Adjustment Administration hurt blacks because we were sharecroppers. So we fast forward to the 60s the great society, and by now we were called blacks. LBJ believed that the problems of housing, income, employment, and health were ultimately a federal responsibility, and he called his vision the great society. Anybody remember the Jetsons? You remember their black neighbor? No, because there were no blacks in the great society. It's <laughs> the way LBJ wanted it. Anyway, liberal historians point to all the legislation that was passed by OBJ in the war on poverty, and they point to the gains, but it was pretty much reapportioning private sector successes and making them into the government successes, and they weren't. But during this time, the federal government did the following. They raised the minimum wage. Now, in 1966, they adopted what was called the Model Cities Act to assure adequate housing to attack urban blight. <laughs> I, I, I have to chuckle at that. <laughs> Just think of Detroit, right? Then he set up a cabinet-level Department of Housing and Urban Development, to be, and he began a program of rent supplements. To promote education, Congress passed the Higher Education Act in 1965 to provide student loans and scholarships, the Elementary and Secondary Schools Act of 1965 for textbooks, the Equal Employment, I'm sorry, the Educational Opportunity Act of 1968 to help fi finance poor kids' finance, uh, fi uh, college educations. 
Then he did the Child Health Improvement and Protection Act of 1968, which provided prenatal and postnatal care, Medicaid, 1968, paid for medical expenses of the poor, Medicare, in 1965, extended medical insurance to older Americans under Social Security. So pretty much this is the deal. Any program that is currently bankrupting this country was begun by FDR and put on steroids by OBJ during this time. And they did all these systems, but they didn't teach the poor how to help themselves. So the left will explain it this way, don't drink and drive, you might spill something. <laughs> so in, 19, in the 1970s, we were still called blacks, but it was a pivotal time in American history, culturally speaking, because blacks were having an impact in ways that you probably didn't even consider. And I'll give you a few uh, flashbacks. So Room 222 was a show that showcased an inner city public school that was actually good. There's a show called Barefoot in the Park that had Tracy Reed and Scoey Mitchell, and it showed a middle-class black couple that was not living in the ghetto. Good times. J.J. proved you could be stupid and survive in the ghetto, and Michael made it cool to be a smart kid in the ghetto, and Winona made me want to live in the ghetto. <laughs> Flip Wilson was our first transvestite. <laughs> the devil made me do it, right? Sanford and Son introduced us to interracial friendships, interracial dating, and interracial police. The Mod Squad proved that white and black youth could work together as equals, and the Jeffersons introduced America to a wealthy black family as well as an interracial marriage. Probably hadn't thought about that, had you? So in the 1980s, we had this black civil war that occurred. You guys probably don't recognize it. But there was a, a, a civil war between the Bookerites and the Du Boisians. And voter, voting patterns by now were holding steady with 80% Democrat, 20% Republican. And the Bookerites were guys like me who said, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Which, by the way, don't try that unless you're out of your boots. <laughs> <laughs> and the Du Boisians were people that believed the government would be there and should be there as your safety net. But what was really interesting was the race pimp was born in the 80s. But so was this uh, ass-scratching, black Anglo-Saxon, boot-licking, buck-dancing, butt-kissing, co-Caucasian, cocktail-sipping, foot-shuffling, high-yeller, handkerchief-head, Opera Thomas, Oreo, cookie, Renatom, servant of the right-wing, self-hating, self-loathing, shoe-shine boy, speak when spoken to, step and fetch it, thank you, boss, uppity uncola, Uncle Tom, race trader, Rush Limbaugh wannabes called black conservatives. to name a few. <laughs> so in Y2K plus eight, we were in the 60s all over again. And by this time, we'd come what I call full circle flip because the election of a black president was supposed to end the idea of racism in America, right? Americans were supposed to be happier than a hippie who made it through customs. But we find ourselves in the midst of this second civil rights movement and the need for this second emancipation. And all this election accomplished was to give America the dumbest, one of the most racist administrations in the history of this country. So is there not enough evidence that blacks or anybody else can achieve whatever they choose in America and that racism is pretty much non-existent in the mainstream? Of course there is. But the left doesn't care about reality. That's why they have Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood is the most racist, sexist, misogynistic industry in America. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Hollywood can legally discriminate against anything. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're too Jew. You're too black. You're too white. Anything. They cannot be sued. And they're malicious in their distortions. There's a new show called One Man Army, I don't know if you've seen this, where the top warriors in the world, ex-Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, friends of mine, Green Berets, and they compete in this obstacle course where they've got to use their brawn and their brain. And the very first show was won by a guy who could not get into the military because he was gay. And he cried at the end of the show. Do you think our Navy SEALs would have cried after winning that show? Or what about the show where the celebrities 
are doing what the military is doing. Have you guys seen this? It's called Stars Earn Stripes. Yeah, so we're supposed to feel safe that Kim Kardashian or maybe Lady Gaga can protect us, right? <laughs> I watched a show called Untamed and Uncut, and I panicked because I thought it was about Bill Clinton, but thankfully it was an amateur video of Animals Gone Wild. <laughs> Some others will get that one later, too. So we have this highly discriminatory group who owns our minds for many hours each day, and they own the minds of our children, and they can push any message that they choose, and they can tell our children that America is racist, or homophobic, or sexist, or whatever. Well, if America was racist, I have this to tell you. You didn't build that. So I was eating a saltine cracker the other day, and a friend called me with a joke that cracked me up. You see, the guy didn't realize that he'd left the door cracked. And well, walked, uh, in walked this crackhead who'd just been kicked out of Cracker Barrel for stealing Cracker Jacks. I just felt like saying that because there's a lot of crackers here. <laughs> So Obama's driving people crazy, and he's emboldening them to do silly things. And here's a true story. A black guy in Ohio was arrested for brandishing a gun at a white guy and demanding that the white guy do the moonwalk. <laughs> Y'all think I'm making this up. <laughs> How demoralizing is that, though? A black guy, apparently so desperate to learn how to moonwalk that he asked a white guy to teach him. <laughs> I may be wrong, but making a white guy dance could be considered a hate crime. <laughs> For the left, if there is even one racist in America, we have to spend trillions of dollars to get rid of, the uh, get rid of him because he can continue the oppression and Obama was supposed to be the man for the job. He's half black, he's half white, so he's acceptable to the black and white racists who elected him. I can only imagine how the moderates and the lefties who voted for him feel now. Probably like I felt when I learned that Fonzie, the coolest yesteryear Italian on TV, was, TV was really a mousy Jewish guy named Winkler. <laughs> so the question is, what has all this feigned racism gotten us? $17 trillion spent on liberals' destructive behaviors cloaked in the war on poverty. By the way, poverty won. You don't believe me? There are flat screen TVs and Nintendos in poor people's homes that we pay for. So we search for diversity in the most diverse country on the planet. I saw a comic that had Obama saying, I won't allow half of the Americans who pay no taxes to carry the burden of the half of the Americans who are not paying their fair share. <laughs> how, how ridiculous is that? Obama wants to convince the half of us who pay taxes that we're not doing enough to cover the half who pay nothing. So we find ourselves, folks, in an amazing time in America, and Obama's keeping us busier than a set of jumper cables at a redneck picnic, <laughs> Appalachian-American picnic. <laughs> and I've, I often say dealing with liberals is like being pecked to death by chickens. Because of racism, Obama has been allowed to ruin our credit, and he continues to spend. This budget reminds me of a joke where the wife asks the husband, should I get a bikini or an all-in-one? And the husband says, babe, you better get a bikini because you'll never get it all in one. <laughs> Liberals are as lost as last year's Easter eggs, and they will either tax you or they will regulate you from the cradle to the grave. Here's a quote from the great Al Sharpton. 
White folks was in caves while we was building empires. We taught philosophy and astrology and mathematics before Socrates and them Greek homos ever got around to it. <laughs> That's going to go down in the history books, isn't it? But ironically, it is the Sharptons of the world who have killed the black empire as the homos of which he speaks have flourished. If there's anybody that deserves the vote for Obama, it is the gays. LGBT, the what, he's made the military, don't ask, don't tell's gone, and, and uh, hate, gay now is a hate crime and all that. So anyway, if you want to have fun with liberals, using a contradiction, ask them what's the speed of dark. I think I asked you guys this last time. Then call them a racist for not knowing. <laughs> it's the same as the speed of light, by the way. So one could argue how people die could be considered racist. Somebody just got that really. <laughs> Did you hear? <laughs> that was like a total delay. <laughs> when, in, in comics, we call that wit lag. <laughs> the time between the joke and the time they get it. <laughs> Yeah, so one could argue how people die is racist. And let me explain. So white folks, you guys are innovative dyers. You die doing things like taunting animals in Africa. You hang glide, you ski off mountaintops, you're killed by an exotic pet or killed by a shark while surfing or kayaking and so on. You're the reason there are shows called I Survived. <laughs> but let me tell you how black folks die. We're killed in our neighborhoods by other black people. And if you think our neighborhoods are unsafe, I suggest you never enter a black woman's womb. Because that is the most dangerous place on earth for a black child. And unfortunately, too many of America's other children are suffering the same fate. As I like to say, too many people die with the song still inside them. Liberals steal ambition from black folks, and this is why black people are inhabitants of our neighborhoods because we don't live there. Living there implies life. Life is vibrant. Inhabitants exist. Liberals have killed the entrepreneurial spirit that fueled the black middle class of the 1950s, and to call liberals' policies a disaster is to be too kind. Liberals have created an ecosystem where when America sneezes, black America gets pneumonia. Obama vowed to end homelessness within 10 years, and one report said that homelessness is up 6%, and this doesn't include those still living in foreclosed properties or squatting in others. Though Obama increased the budget for homelessness 24%, the poverty rate under him has risen 1.8%, and that was from a report in 2009. This increase is the highest since Jimmy Carter, which I call the peanut era. No way to treat 3.5 million fraudulent 2008 Obama voters who had no homes. Are you aware of that statistic? The left will try to convince you that the best surfing is in Nebraska. They drive SUVs with the fuel economy of a Saturn rocket and they lecture you on carbon footprints. They have corporate umbrellas and pensions the size of satellites, but they call the middle class of America rich. So how do we get to a place where out-of-touch political fat cats with warped sensibilities are dictating how much of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness you're entitled to. 66% of senators are millionaires and 41% of congressmen are. 1% of the rest of America is. Shameless plug, by the way, I am up for adoption in case there are any millionaires in the audience. <laughs> now, Frank and Mary have put in a bid. Where are they? There they are. <laughs> <laughs> in case anybody wants to adopt a middle-aged black guy. <laughs> With my kids. You gotta, I got four boys. <laughs> Two in college, just in full disclosure. <laughs> so the conservative rich should be admired. The liberal rich are hypocrites. It's true. <laughs> because... Conservatives, we don't care if people want to pursue their fortunes, but the disingenuous liberals want us to be poor and they'll build their fortunes on our backs. Liberalism's tricky. It can get you killed, too. 
There was a survey where they asked a group of people who, who uh, if they would cross the street, if they saw a gang of black teens in blue jeans and white beaters approaching. 78% of whites said yes, and they were called racist. 22% of whites said no, and they were called victims. <laughs> You'll get that later, I promise. <laughs> My point is, folks, it's okay to profile. Ironically, I would not cheat off of a Mexican in Spanish class, but I would cheat off an Asian in French class. <laughs> That's not how you spell bueno, Essie. A <laughs> little bit of wit lag going on, so I'm going let to <laughs> let some people catch up. <laughs> Remember when you didn't have to explain to somebody about your partner if you were with a business? My partner. I'm in business. It's my business partner. When straight men not crooked, gay men happy, and queer men strange or odd, right? Black people want to be called African Americans. 99.9% .9 of black people have never been to Africa. They don't know how many countries are in Africa. They don't know how many languages are spoken. 51 countries, by the way. Give or take, depends on if somebody's taken over one or given up one. <laughs> in over 2,000 languages. Blacks don't walk around trying to figure out what you are. See, I heard you're German, Kevin. I don't know. It's a good topic of conversation. We don't do that. We don't care where you're from. And if you're going to hyphenate, pick a country, not a continent, OK? And exactly what is an entitlement? You're entitled to what you earn. Everything else is charity. And would you make an investment in any government agency? If you would, I really want to talk to you in the lobby. <laughs> government doesn't invest. It taxes and waste. So people theorize that Obama was the Antichrist. Do you guys remember that? They're like, oh, this is the coming, you know. And there are signs. <laughs> you just got to know how to read them. So let me give you an example. In the recent Olympics, a white guy from Britain won the long jump. <laughs> Think about it. I thought when I saw a black man at a square dance once that that was the seventh sign, but no. So we are near the end of days, folks. I just proved it. <laughs> Government doesn't want us to know that we've gone from being citizens to being consumers. Our role is to consume what the government feeds us. I'm tired of being a consumer. Like Spartacus, we've all been born into this new form of slavery. And the cost, as I said earlier, is about $17 trillion, and it's growing. But we won't have to pay most of it. It's going to be our kids and our grandkids. So maybe I just long for the days when I used to walk around with a pick stuck in my big fro. I did have a fro. Just because I can rock the ball doesn't mean I didn't have a fro. And I had been fooled by my parents, who were my grandparents, because my mother passed away and my grandparents raised me. But they fooled me into believing that a black man could be anything, including president. Let me tell you folks something. In 2008, I was not surprised. I knew that was possible. I didn't want it to be him. <laughs> I was told, if you fall in a pile of horse poop, get up and look for the pony. <laughs> That's an optimist. So we are bonded today to end identity politics. We fight for one race, the human race. <laughs> but we fight with the understanding that to wage this fight from America makes us the luckiest folks on the planet. 
We're soldiers in a civil war, folks, against the left and that ideology. We fight to preserve a way of life that we treasure and a treasure that we want to pass on to our kids and our grandkids. G.K. Chesterton wrote, the true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. What's behind you? What are you fighting for? Thanks for fighting with me, because we're going to make history together, preserving the greatest nation under God with liberty and justice for all. God bless you. How are we doing on time? Thank you. I want to take a few questions. Got a microphone? Oh, there we go. Um, we have Amendment 64 in Colorado, which is to legalize recreational marijuana. And uh, yesterday on the way up here, I heard on the radio, the head of, well, the NAACP has endorsed Amendment 64 in Colorado. And so on the radio yesterday, I heard the head of the region, that it's Colorado, Wyoming, and two other states, NAACP region, that lady was speaking on the radio. And she said that the reason they have endorsed it is because black people, uh, they use the same amount of drugs as white people, but more blacks are disproportionately convicted or accused of being potheads. Right. How can we, I mean, that is ridiculous for the NAACP to stick their nose in that issue. And, and how can we fight this? It's ridiculous. Well, I've, Okay, so I'll answer that question in a roundabout way. One of the topics, Valerie Jarrett met with the uh, uh, black journalists because they felt like they were being snubbed by Obama. And they were, because he got elected and he was like, I'm through with you black folks, that's all I needed. <laughs> but anyway, so one of the th things that she actually said was a good thing for blacks. She said health care, that was one, Obama tax, because apparently black people use medical more than whites. I thought we all died at the same rate, but maybe I'm wrong on that. But one of the things was they claimed that there was a disproportionate law with, uh, between crack cocaine. It was disproportionate sentencing. That's why government loves, st loves statistics, by the way, because they get to play that game. Oh, well, there's twice as many blacks as whites on drugs. Well, there's four times more drugs in black communities. The question is, why aren't there more? So they play those games. And we allow those games to be played because every time you check white, Hispanic, or whatever, you're playing that game. There's a, a thing right now in the Chicago school systems, and there's a black administrator and educator who's under fire because he, they said that um, blacks were being, um, I guess, reprimanded in schools at twice the margin of whites, uh, of other races. And he said, this, using his own words, he said, black kids need to quit clowning. And he said, they don't have parents. And, and you know, they're coming here as, as thugs, and we're having to reprimand them more than others. But this is a black teacher saying, it isn't like he's picking on black kids. But government loves those stats because they get to throw them back in your face. And we buy it. And that's why the if you accept this gift, we're going to fly you all to my treatment center. <laughs> right? Because you need an intervention. You've been taught to believe that you can't speak up about these things, and it's flatly wrong. And you, you get this ridiculous comment about blacks are getting more, worse sentencing than marijuana. If we're using more marijuana and we're being stopped for marijuana, it has nothing to do with your color. It has to do with the fact that you're using marijuana. That's it. You know, the kid, look. Wouldn't you like to have this, con this conversation? Um, in Chicago schools, we had this many reprimands, and it's bad that we're having to reprimand all these kids. No color, no religion, no nothing. Bad kids are disruptive to good kids. Let's stop the bad kids. But well, we don't have those conversations. So, 
Uh, Kevin, I was unaware uh, until you just spoke about it that 95% uh, of black Americans voted Republican through the 1880s. Mm -hmm. But in uh, 2008, we had 95% of black Americans voting for Obama. We call that racism ever? Well, people would disagree on, on the stats, but let's just go with that and say that it is. And the short answer is yes, it is racist. And now you're going to have a tough time convincing blacks, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, I voted. Why'd you vote for Obama? I voted for him because he's black. Well, that's racist. No, not really. You know, it was, it was, it was historical. It was, you know, they're going to give you who shot John for 50 reasons why it was the thing to do. And even now that they know he's been a dismal failure, I call him the Mookie Robinson of baseball, you know. <laughs> Blacks would have never been in the big leagues if, it were for, if Obama were it, right? We may never have another black president because of Obama. So, but, but because of that, you know, you're, you're going to get that. But the fact is it's racist. But those aren't the bad racists. There, there are a group of blacks who say, look, let's, let's get this over with. By the way, and I think we talked about this last time I was here, Obama's not the first black president. If you look at the one drop rule, there have been six others. The most notable is Dwight Eisenhower, who was 25% black. 25% black makes you black. And let me tell you, go on the internet and look at Dwight Eisenhower, pull his pictures up. You'll, now that you know, you'll go, you know what? He does look a little black. <laughs> he looks a lot more black. But by the way, no offense to Dwight, half of you can get as dark as Dwight Eisenhower. Color is so arbitrary in what people do with their lives. It is sickening to me. First of all, black people can be lightened. I know you don't believe that, but we can. If I go out of the sun for two years, I'll come back and I'll be as white as this man right here. But if he goes into the sun for two years, he'll be as dark as I am. It is so arbitrary. And I've said this before, you're not even the same color on your own body, for goodness sake. You guys have farmer's tans, don't lie. So, so what are we talking about here? You, color, color is so non, it, it, it's nonplus. I mean, why are we doing, but government loves it. They love it because it is a way to divide you. If you made everybody in America opaque with blue eyes, the government would figure out a way to see a difference tomorrow. M multiple differences. Yes, sir. Let me ask a question while I'm bringing this up here, oh, okay. Kevin. One of the things that I became aware of pretty late, maybe only 20 years or so ago, is that the exact opposite seems to be the case with what Ronald Reagan said, that government is the problem and not the solution. Right. In the black community, that is definitely not accepted. Am I correct about that? Well, you're right and you're wrong. And that's why I'm here, because the bus, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the jumbo jet's waiting. No, okay, so let me just tell you, there's a game being played. Everybody thinks black people love government. No, they don't. Black people don't trust government. We don't at all. And there are many, many blacks that understand the gun laws. Did you hear Ice-T recently say, gun, if you, owning my gun is my right, and if you try to take it from me, you're try, essentially you're trying to make me a slave. Ice-T, rapper, you know? I tell the story of a nephew of mine who's, uh, he's been shot three times and stabbed three times. He's a nephew-in-law. <laughs> and, and he's cleaned himself up here. But uh, and he, he's not for Obama, and I'll tell that story in a second. But back to government. We don't trust government. Blacks do not trust government. But you know what we will do? We will play the government game. We are unbelievable at understanding all the ins and outs and how you get 30 more dollars or 50 more dollars here to do this or that because we play the game. But what people don't realize is black people also watch Rich uh, Housewives of Insert Urban Indoctrination Center here. They know, you know how other people live, and they also know government is never going to let you live that way. But in the meantime, while I'm trying to get mine, you know, I'm going to let government do what it has to do. But I don't trust government. So there's an opportunity to go there and make that happen. But you're not going to do it with the same old tired crap sorry, that the conservative movement and the, certainly the Republican Party has tried to do for years, which is nothing. That's the difference. 
I'm sure that you'll opine about what I'm going to say right now and have a lot, a lot to comment on. But um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and that's probably one of the most integrated communities, big cities in, in the country. And one of the talk show hosts in Atlanta is Neil Bortz, who's syndicated around the country. And he talks about race quite a bit. And one of the things that, uh, one of the lies that gets perpetrated by the left is the overuse of the term racism or racist. And he likes to talk about this a lot, the difference between racist, people who are discriminating, and people who are prejudiced. People, blacks voted for Obama probably because they were prejudiced. They, they, people, everybody's prejudiced. They, they have an opinion no, about racist. things. Well, maybe, maybe yes and maybe no. But if you people, vote for somebody based on a single characteristic, that being color, you're racist. Well, racist, again, this, Neil Bortz would have a different opinion about okay. this. Because racism is is a, a violent it's not violent but it's it's an abhorrent dislike or or a a uh, antipath antipathy towards towards a certain race of people and I th I think that the the black community had black pride and that's why they voted for him because he was black just like if just like when John Kennedy ran for president most Irish Catholics right. voted for John you're Kennedy. Fir you're first on the bus. <laughs> Let me tell you why. That is absolutely no, no offense, Hal. I mean, it's a great question. That is completely wrong. Black people in America are racist, and they are racist against whites. They are being told that you are the enemy, and you're doing nothing to stop it. You're not the enemy. In my book, I talk about being this kid who was poor, but who was exposed to rich people, rich white people. And even as this little kid, I can remember feeling like I'm supposed to not like these rich white people. But I did, because I was around them. And they always showed me love. They were always caring. They all, Kevin, do you, you need something? A, a quick story, Betty Mormon, the family that owned, they were wealthy, very wealthy family. And uh, her husband was going to go to Africa. She was gonna, they were going to go to Kenya. And so I overhear Lewis, Mormon, and I, he's like, yeah, Bill, so is the safari ready to go and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other? Because that's how white people talk, especially the rich ones. <laughs> <laughs> and so I overhear Lou talking to Bill about, you know, this big safari. And I'm like, Mr. Mormon, you're going to Kenya to go big game hunting? And Betty is doing a puzzle in the other room. In the, it was an indoor patio that was bigger than our house. And she's like, Lou, take Kevin. That was it. Now, you tell me what's the hate. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> now... <laughs> By the way, any of you who want to reenact that story with me, feel free. <laughs> but, but, you know, so, so the, the problem is, is that black kids in America, just like you probably, it's hard for us to even believe that there are Muslim kids, this barely coming of age, and they're being taught to hate this country. There are black kids being taught to hate you, not on any, for any reason whatsoever, except you're white. My producer, one of my producers was in D.C., walking with his camera during one of the big events going down there, and a little black girl walked past him and said, Cracker? She was six years old, six, seven years old. He's walking with a camera, not doing anything, walking along, Cracker, and looks at him, she mean mugs him. And, he, and this dude is 6'4", like 260 pounds, and this little bitty girl mean mugs my producer. No reason. So I'm telling you, you may think that blacks are not being told, that blacks are being told not to like you for no other reason than you're making money, you're oppressing us, you don't want to give your fair share, and all this. We've become an entitlement society that I'm telling you is going to break the back of this country if you don't stop with this political correctness and running from these issues and supporting groups like mine. <laughs> <laughs>
Kevin, I've, I've heard it said that anybody that thinks like I do is brilliant. So I just want <laughs> you to know, I think you're brilliant. <laughs> but um, I'm curious because uh, listening to what you say about the black community, uh, I think is also true in, in a lot of the underprivileged white community, but sure. I think it all comes down to education. And I know that there's people in this room who feel pretty strongly about that. And you, you're you just a delight because you speak intelligently, you think like I do. And uh, I, Can I'm you moonwalk, by the way? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we could both get on the bus <laughs> together. But I, I'm just, are you educated? How how did you arrive at being able to think through these situations like you have because you're so unusual? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you guys a secret. Seriously, this is the secret to how to raise a kid and this is in my first book, The Big Black Life, honest to God. So my oldest brother, who's my cousin, his name is Larry, but we call him my brother because he lived with us most of the time because his parents couldn't afford to keep him. That's how black people live, all right? So his name is Larry, he's 11 years older than I am, but he's like my brother. Now I have an actual brother that's a year and a few months older than I am, Kirk, but Larry is like my big brother and my confidant and he, al he was always there for me, just like my other brother, but th th we just had this other thing. But he's my cousin. So Larry was 11 years older and he was always doing things before me, he was in college and all that, but he'd come stay back with the family. And my cousin Larry had this weird habit he would come back and he'd, he'd ask the most crazy questions like he'd say, vanilla or chocolate? Pick. And you're like, what? vanilla or chocolate? Pick. And you go, vanilla. Oh, you don't like chocolate. You know, and you're, no, it's not. I mean, pick the best. I didn't say pick the best one. I just said pick. Why'd you pick vanilla? You know, and he'd go through this crazy cycle with you, right? And I remember he asked me one time, he said, uh, now I'm eight years, I'm nine years old. And he says to me, uh, death penalty, <laughs> nine years old, for it or against it? And I go, for it, you know? And he goes, what if Kirk, my brother, killed somebody? You for it then? I go, well, what did he kill him for? <laughs> you know? And then he's, he goes, protecting you. Oh, well, then I'd be against it. Oh, but, and then he, so he gives you all these scenarios. And what I learned is, you never answer the question with my brother. <laughs> you don't. You, watch my, my interviews on MSNBC and all that. I don't answer their questions. I ask more questions. So I, I became, he would say, Ferrari or Ford F-150 in a race. Who wins? What's the terrain? Good question. <laughs> right? So you just, be, now, God, yeah, I'm a smart kid and, you know, I'm a critical thinker and all that, but you, he taught me how to think about things and ask questions and do that. That's what people don't do. You guys say blacks are religious. No, they're not. I watch a show called Bait Car, and I'm going to end it here because I'm getting the hook. Um, <laughs> I watch a show called Bait Car. Two black guys are just going to steal this bait car. It's, it's kind of what it is. Cops set the car up as bait. And it's got cameras in it and audio and all that. These two black guys get in it and, and they're going to steal the car. And the first thing that the guy does that's a driver is he looks up to heaven and he does the sign of the cross. And then he gets, looks at the, the passenger and he says, do it. And the guy goes, and he didn't really know what to do. So they're cruising down the road and the guy says, the guy driving goes, man, I can't believe the Lord has given us this car. So then the cops have a way to disable the car. And they disabled it. And then the guy goes, oh, Lord. <laughs> so he was consistent. <laughs> but here's the point. Who uses God to go, thank you for letting me steal this car that is not mine. But you have been told by the media, blacks are religious. And we're religious because somebody will steal a big screen TV, take it home to their mom, and the mom will go, you know the Lord don't like that, but hang it over there. And you're going, that's religion. That is not religion. And you have to start waking up to what you're seeing and not what you're being told. And that's why this intervention is occurring. <laughs>
Thank you.